Um, welcome again to our Thursday's Faith Refresher. So in the first session on the Sixth Commandment, we considered the following. Number one, every human being is a person with particular sexuality, man or woman, created in the image and likeness of God. This sexuality is a gift, and when utilized in the correct context, that is for love, it enables us to go forth and multiply and reproduce in ourselves the image of God. Second, that to protect this dignity, we have to live chastity. And it is through this virtue that we can love our bodies. Devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and our Blessed Mother is the only way to acquire this virtue. We learned also that we do not only pray the Hail Mary, but Father gave us a mnemonic that we can use to remember the means to live chastity. So using each letter of the Hail Mary, uh, if we may refresh, so the letters stand for H, honesty, A, ask, I, intense work, L, lifeline, M, materials or media, A, appropriate gestures, R, restraint in food and drink, and Y, yield or be generous. So tonight or today, we delve further into the beautiful virtue of chastity. It may be a coincidence that the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, corresponds to the sixth beatitude. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Why is Jesus concerned about the purity of heart as a pathway to heaven? Are chastity and fidelity confined to sexual abstinence? If everyone should be chaste, how do I go about it? Who do I hurt when I don't strive to live a chaste life? So Father JP will once again help us answer these questions. We will pray the Hail Mary first and foremost, as we always do, uh, asking her that uh, we absorb many things today, especially to the virtue closest to her, you know, chastity. In the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, last time we managed to to tackle the first part of lesson six. If you recall, we learned that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And because of this, the sexuality that we possess, the vehicle of our personhood or personality is entrusted to each one of us and has to be protected, definitely. St. John Paul II said, God is assigned as a duty to every man the dignity of every woman, and to every woman, the dignity of every man. And then we also took the quote from another known author by the name of St. Augustine, when he said the chastity or the cleanliness or cleanness of heart holds a glorious and distinguished place among the virtues, because that virtue alone enables man to see God. Hence, truth itself said, the sixth beatitude, blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. In this quote, we highlighted last time that we are called to live this chastity. There is a vocation innate in every man to live this virtue. A vocation uh, because he is called to love, he is made out of love, and he is for love whether he gives, it, he gives himself to God directly or he gives himself to another spouse, another person. He will be able to see God, hence truth itself, the way, the truth, and the life, only through this virtue. The third quote comes from St. Philip Neri. Devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and devotion to the Blessed Mother are not simply the best way, but in fact, the only way 
to keep purity. Then we extended further this quote into some a mnemonic, H-A-I-L-M-A-R-Y, to help us see there are ways, there are means to keep purity intact. So that we learn the virtue of chastity, we have to be honest, we have to ask for it. It is granted to those who ask for it in humility, St. Jose Maria would write in the way. Intense work, we have to go to the sacraments, the lifeline, really. Sacrament of confession, the sacrament of the Eucharist, the devotion to the blessed sacrament as mentioned by the saint. Our materials, the books, the magazines, our social media that we, are, we have to be also discerning. Then we have need the modesty, appropriateness in the gestures, in the clothing, restraint in other aspects, specifically of the appetites, the restraint in food and drink, food and beverage, and then a life of giving, yield, why? Hail Mary. And I think we ended there uh, with that uh, slide. If, um, although I think we started already. Uh, with the fourth point, uh, this is now the one of uh, marriage, chastity in marriage. So many guessed which quote this comes from in a, a previous lesson. It is from Saint Jose Maria. Okay, he said that human love, pure, sincere, and joyful, cannot subsist in marriage without the virtue of chastity which leads a couple to respect the mystery of sex and ordain it to faithfulness and personal dedication. Chastity or purity, he said, is a joyful affirmation of love. In this quote, which is also appearing in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, published in 1992 by St. John Paul II, the virtue of chastity is seen from a very positive point of view. And here, first and foremost, it is lived in the majority of cases, the majority of calls or specific vocations that everyone is called to. When I say majority, because many are called to live a life of marriage, even in that context, there is a call to live the integrity, the, sex, the sexuality, integrating the sex, sexuality into their personhood. We will delve further into this point what exactly does Saint Jose Maria mean? How exactly can couples understand chastity in marriage? So first point, I think you see in your slides that I'm highlighting a word, and that is human love or human. Um, in um, the document of Saint John Paul II entitled Familiaris Consortio, he says that um, sexuality or conjugal act can only be exercised in a human way if it is an integral part of the love by which a man and a woman commit themselves totally to one another until death. He's mentioning there in that power, those powerful lines that sex can only be exercised not as an animal or an as instinctive way, not as beasts, in the most human way, in other words, in a commitment of love. Without which, without the context of marriage, sexuality or the, the act will always be leading towards use, pleasure, or, or, not, not, uh, or mutual gain, and not for the love of the person. The most human way, and the only human way, in fact, that the act of sexuality uh, can be exercised is there in a context of marriage. Okay. Another uh, point here, or another, there's a mystery of sex. The highlight there that you see on your screens. Uh, what do you mean by this? No? Um, the mystery of sex is such that all human beings have that capacity to engender 
another, another of his own species. And since human beings, human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, this is such a privilege that the act is called procreation. Man is given that opportunity, specifically in marriage, to create with God, using his flesh, another human being. And since we have premised earlier that human beings are created for love, through love, and out of love, there in the human, uh, in the mystery of sex, therefore, there are rules, strict moral conditions, so that it could be exercised in a human way. In general, this rule is this, and I'll say it, that the unitive and the procreative dimensions of such act, meaning that both are in union when they do it, and that both are open to life, makes it, you would say, under or subject or within the God, God's design about it. When one of the couples, or both of them, try to segregate or separate the unity from the procreative aspect, for example, in the case of contraception, like in the case of contraception, in the use of condoms and other contraceptive means, there is unitive aspect, but they are not open to life. There is no procreative dimension in the act. In such a scenario, okay, they're not respecting God's design. On another level, on a different example, when there is, for example, a procreative aspect, there is a life that is that's wanted to be, uh, that's desired to come out, but there is no union of the two. This is the case of the IVF, for example, or the artificial dissemination. Then the creator likewise, because of such separation of two dimensions he instilled in that act, it is not good in the eyes of the creator. This is a long study that the church was able to pronounce in Humanae Vitae, in St. Paul VI. It's good to note that um, this sexuality, this conjugal union, this marriage is really beautiful first and foremost. And God had designed wonderful things for it, including his divine design, so that love can be exercised between the two, and that they could engender also love through children. If we disrespect that, then God is not happy about it. It's not something that the church imposes. It's something directly related to the creator. This is how I see it. Um, this is an analogy. Let's consider a painting that is wonderful, precious, beautiful, a masterpiece, let's say by an artist, uh, for example, Picasso. It's expensive. It's a painting that you own and you want to hang it. <laughs> you want to hang it in the wall of your new home, newly constructed house. And then later on, look at it on display. Invite your friends to see the beauty of it and reap praises because you, have, you are in the possession of it. Now, let's imagine that the construction workers, when you were transferring, to that new house. They saw it and they don't value it. They don't realize how expensive it was. And they used it for a paperweight <laughs> because there were newspapers all over the floor and they wanted them, these newspapers, not to fly around. They used your Picasso <laughs> because you're painting to cover these newspapers. Now think about it. What is the reaction of Picasso? <laughs> What is the reaction of the owner of the painting? Definitely, he will be angry or she will be consumed to anger. I'm not sure. Uh, she will scold the, um, uh, the construction workers. No, they don't know the value of it. Uh, if we have been combining, uh, we have been studying already you know, the past five commandments, we have realized that life is so precious. It's given by God. 
And this is the generation of life. It's a follow up to the fifth commandment. And it's so precious as well. Then the creator protects it at all costs. And he would want us, uh, the creator, God himself, to abide by these moral standards, moral criteria. Not because we are simply burdened, but because he wants us to love one another and not use each other. Okay. Um, last point here is regarding being the joyful affirmation, which I think all of us have to continue to study and realize. We are able to uplift our spirits to be um, in good relations with God thanks to chastity. If there are problems in this, it is very difficult also to love genuinely. Now, in the formation for children, and there are many mothers in the class right now, it is good to highlight that sex is a joyful affirmation of love and chastity likewise. There is a tendency in moral theology up to until quite recently the chastity is all about prohibitions. Bawal, bawal, bawal. Where in fact, it is not about that. It is about a deep sense of love and truly being happy about it. Maybe to our adolescent children, we will start explaining this. It is by the mere or by the fact that we are in love that we can engage in other activities, that we are able to give ourselves to one another. I'm speaking of mothers. And for those who are single, likewise, it is by the, by the way, the, this means uh, chastity by which we can give ourselves to God and we can live peacefully each day. So it's joyful affirmation of love. We have to highlight that all the positive things regarding this. I underlined it already because later on, when we talk about the sins, chastity, maybe uh, we could be overwhelmed. Okay. Let's go to the chastity now in celibacy. But before that, let's guess who said this quote first. Okay, um, please prepare yourselves because we will now continue our game of the hula hoop. We are now in the point regarding the chastity in the, with the apostolic celibacy. Okay, and I want you to guess who said this quote? Okay, before I launch a survey, I'll read it for you. A clean heart is a free heart. A free heart can love Christ with an undivided love in chastity, convinced that nothing and nobody will separate it from his love. So who said this? Let's look at the slide, and I think you have the answer. This is Mother Teresa Falcota. Now, see, she has a powerful quote about the cleanliness of heart. Now, and this is enables, uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, the chastity is an enabling virtue so that we can give to our Lord, for those who are called in the apostolic celibacy, undivided love in chastity. Okay, I'll say a few things because uh, it's good also that uh, the majority in this room also realizes that there is a specific gift in celibacy and also the specific struggle of continence if for a person who is called to that vocation. So um, for the person who is called to celibacy, she has to exercise continence she will not be able, she will not, she has offered her body also to the Lord and she will not engage in the conjugal act or in the pleasure of it. Not for any other thing, but for love. For love of God primarily. Now, some of you may say, well, will that person be kawawa naman? Uh, he or she will not be complete. Well, the catechism or the church teaches that in celibacy, actually, the person 
can also arrive at fulfillment, a completion. We teach in the church, husband and wife, complement each other. But a person can also be complete already, even without complementing or giving self to the other, if God wills. So in the exclusion of one's reproductive capacity, this in no way entails excluding love or affection. Now, this is a general notion of many persons who, in relation to, to people who are um, called to a life of celibacy, whether it is in the consecrated life, like Mother Teresa, or in the lay or secular state, it is also possible. The path of many in the work, or some in the Opus Dei, numeraries and associates, we call them, and also to the sacred orders. There are differing degree, uh, circumstances, but all are called to apostolic celibacy. And with God, they all complete themselves already. Now, so they are not sadder or lonelier than the rest of the human beings. No? They have found their joy, their peace of mind in the Lord. And their call to live chastity also entails a struggle, but at the same time, great reward. The possibility of married life is foregone, and it enables them to love and give themselves to many souls. A person generally um, gives himself in celibacy for other souls so that he or she could be of service to them. In the, same, in the case of the sacred minister, this is obvious. No? That's why in the early centuries, the Western at least, imposed since father needs to follow christ who was celibate and give his heart for his parish it is imposed as a rule priests have to be celibate the same for those in the consecrated life and they help many souls the say consecrated life in giving testimony to the last things because in heaven um we will be giving our whole bodies and souls to god no? And they are starting that here in this world already. For those in the middle of the world, they are still giving testimony in a sense, not in the consecrated scenario, but in their promise. They don't have a vow. They are ordinary citizens through and through. Okay, so um, and the chastity that they are called to live is specific. No? Um, just, um, yeah, just, a personal anecdote. I mean, I don't put myself as that. Well, I have learned also from others who have lived this virtue in the celibate state. Now, ordinarily, at the, in, the, in the youth, uh, there is some struggle, okay? But uh, the Lord really gives grace. The Lord really allows it and supplements all the necessities that each person may need, specifically when he calls somebody to this. Now, let's proceed to... The last quote. Okay, this is the quote. We will now proceed to sins against chastity. Okay, the quote is, It is not always in the soul's power not to feel a temptation, but it is always in its power not to consent to it. Okay, the answer... It is a writing of this saint, which you now see on the screen, Saint Francis de Sales. Okay. So we have tackled these different points, no? The one regarding uh, male and female, the first point, he created them. Our sexuality is from God, and it is connected to the dignity and uh, the way we were created, man and woman, it's a calling to the vocation, chastity. We use means, the Hail Mary is here. The third point, we try to peer into the chastity in marriage. There's a mystery of sexuality. The general rule, unitive and procreative, have to be always together. It's a joyful affirmation. We have to explain to children who are aspiring for such a call as well, and many would receive the call to get married. We give our love to each other, but in the sake, and the, sorry, in the case of those who have a specific call, 
to celibacy, it's giving their love to God. Okay, we are now in the last, and now you see in our screens, it's the sins against chastity. Okay, so it is not, it's always, um, it's not always in the soul's power not to feel a temptation. I think all of us um, are undergone a certain temptation. And actually, temptation is inescapable in relation to chastity. And we're really daring to say that. Some have more intense, some have less. Okay? The rule is we have to avoid temptations as much as we can. We have to flee from temptations. But we have to keep in mind the temptations in itself, if we don't give in exposing ourselves to them, we are not sinning. Sin consists in the consent. Okay? Okay. Very good, Julius. Okay. The consent in the, um, in the act. Now, and the important is, we do not consent. That's why St. Francis de Sales' um, quote is very important. God always gives us the power not to consent to overcome. If he allows temptation in chastity, he also gives us the strength infusing our soul, whatever, the Holy Spirit in grace to overcome such temptation. Okay, I will say something that uh, uh, perhaps um, will be important in the sense that um, these things will help the, the penitent identify what exactly is the sin. Okay, so it's good exercise to know for all of us the exact name of the sin against chastity. All of them consist, the sins against chastity, of a disorder. And that disorder is called lust. Okay, so um, the sin against chastity mainly is a disordered desire for or inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure is more disordered when sought for itself, when it is isolated from its procreative and unitive purposes. So if we are going for those who are not married only for pleasure, or for those who are married, we separate something in the, either the unitive and the procreative, and basically that is egoistic as well, then we fail against this virtue of chastity and we fall into lust. But there are specifics aside from that general rule, okay? And these are the following. This sexual pleasure, for example, can be done to one's own, stimulating one's genital organs, and that's, called, that's what you call masturbation. When this um, sexual pleasure is sought for or sought after with someone of the same sex. And that's what you call homosexual acts. Those are, these are the names of the sins against chastity. When it's done with another who is not your own because you are married, you have another. There's another person to whom you have given yourself and to whom you belong. He or she possesses you as spouse. Then that is, the, te the technical term there is adultery. No, um, I remember in the chaplaincies, I was uh, told in the uh, in the confession always no, the grade two per, the grade two students. No, I committed adultery. No, so I always correct them. It's impossible. You cannot commit adultery. That's another thing. So that's a simple um, a specification no, of uh, chastity, or rather, of a sin against chastity. Adultery is that of Sleeping with another, having sex with another who is not your wife or is not your husband, okay? Yeah, or who belongs to another or is not married and you're married, okay? If this is not yet your own, meaning uh, the persons involved in the act, the union, sexual union, are not married, the third te technical term is fornication. Now, for example, boyfriend, girlfriend, they did sex 
before marriage, we call it premarital sex. Then the technical term there is fornication. When it is about forcing to have one's own, to have that pleasure with violence, it's called rape. When there is a display of what should have been one's or another's own, because these have uh, also consequences in terms of privacy, then what's, that's what you call pornography. Now, what is the scene of pornography? When you are co um, contemplating or enjoying something that is the display of what should have been another's own, meaning it should be in the left, in left into the intimacy of the couple, and not for pleasure alone, or not for pleasure for the others. Okay, so it, I have the keyword O W N own all the time. Okay, if it's selling one's own or buying what cannot be owned, actually, we call this prostitution. And when there is no ownership at all, it could be conversations, could be looks, manifestation of affection for another person, including fiancés prompted by a lewd desire. Now, there's a gray area there uh, that all of us, perhaps, especially in the boyfriend girlfriend state, have to just keep in mind. You know? And that is the general rule of thumb, I think, is before God, can you manifest that affection that way? And that's what I tell people. If you feel guilty, then perhaps there was something wrong. Okay? Um, the same, I also say this to boy, people in that same relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, if they are uncomfortable in showing it to the parent of that fiancé, then probably you know, that act of intimacy may not be proper at all. You know? So it's, it's a gray area. Each person's conscience will have to discern exactly on this. Um, okay. Now, this and the last point that I'll mention, I like to highlight that um, it has sad consequences. No? This virtue of chastity, when we don't take care of it, really uh, leads to slavery. Slavery. Now, um, I have here another mnemonic so that you remember <laughs> and so that um, it's easy to memorize no? what exactly are the things that could happen to somebody who doesn't take care of Chastity. So the first there is impaired thinking. So the intellect is really affected. Uh, in fact, um, decision making, the decision making processes, the, the neurons are also affected, also biologically, because there's an incongruence with what the person has in his heart or her heart in her actuation. So impaired thinking. That's one, that's the letter I. Huh? Next, the W stands for a weak will. Um, all of us, when we are, as all of us are undergoing a personal formation of conscience, we have to also make our faculties, when I mean faculties, trained, including our will. We need strong will. We need a life of virtue so that we can always say yes to God. So in the virtue of chastity, this is perhaps cemented. We can be true to what we want. We can be true to what we said. We can be true in front of God because we have strengthened our will. When we allow, in the different uh, levels, no, lacks of chastity, even in the details, then this weakening of the will starts. And it's very difficult because all the other virtues are also affected. So that's W, weak will. Now, uh, this third, it starts with letter H, inner screen. It is true. Hatred of God. Why? Because God is seen as somebody who imposes commands or rules. And God is seen as somebody who makes life difficult. And sometimes this also happens. No? Um, these rules cannot be followed because of a weak will. And so they go and shop 
other religious denominations, they go and transfer to other sects or groups of Christians. So the hatred of God <laughs> can also stem from that. The transfer, conversion to other religions of less, you would say, you know, uh, quality you know, for, for personal convenience is a consequence of this, especially for those who have not lived chastity in the married state. Okay, I'm now going to the another eye. This is the second eye. This one is related to a weakened will. Now, in, uh, in terms of the way it sees others, other, you would say, decisions. A person who have slackened in chastity can easily be indifferent to many things. It's all the same. Why? Because his integrity is already questioned for himself. So it's all the same whether I choose this or that. I'm indifferent whether I go to this or that because of that loss of integrity. Okay. And then we have the letter P. P is so connected to indifference. P stands for passivity. When a person is indifferent not to many choices, then he doesn't care anymore about several other decisions. Actually, um, I'm saying consequences of lacks of chastity, but if we have family members who show these symptoms, you, won't, you should not conclude that uh, this is already lack of chastity. Uh, definitely not. But it's good to be vigilant, na, to be watchful na, in relation to persons who are very passive in things, not goal-oriented, because the, the weak weakness of will also affects this. And the last, with the you, I whip you because uh, you have fallen into several sins of chastity, is a result or a consequence of the same lack of virtue. Undo attachments. So undo attachments, meaning a person can easily be attached to persons, places, things, items. Now, the internet is, uh, a person cannot escape the social media because of this. A person cannot be getting out of his games because of this. Bad habits and likewise extracurricular activities because of this. He cannot get, let go of friendships and do attachments to many other things because of the addictive state or the nature of lacks of chastity. Okay? Um, with that, I will end. But I, I would want to conclude with a very uh, positive note. It is possible to be chaste. It's good to talk about it. There are persons in the contemporary world who have been chaste. There are persons who have been canonized in our century. It is possible for persons to be in a married state and also be chaste. It's good to read about them, about their lives. I, the, the top of my list right now is Blessed Carlo Cutis. At the age of adolescence, no? he was chased, close to the Eucharist. And for married couples, the first thing per a couple on my list is Thomas Alvira and Paquito Dominguez. Ten children, one woman man, one man woman, led to the candid a possible canonization of both. And there are many others. There are groups who help support, quote unquote, other communities and persons so that this can be a reality. There are persons who listen and help out, who counsel, who sort things out, or company, so that this is possible. And in time, but, but, but most importantly, with grace, this is really, a re this could be a reality. Uh, chastity also for one's personal life and beyond, until we see God face to face. Given the popularity of and ease in accessing movies and shows through live stream services, mm -hmm. how do we minimize the risk of viewing pornographic films? Are there uh, resources and websites we can refer to help us for the assessment of the moral content of these films? Uh, there are many. There are many websites. Um, Screenit.com, uh, even IMDb Parents Guide is also a good um, tool for movies. If you are in contact with the centers, it's also good because sometimes there are things sent to us 
Now, for example, for from me, from my end, these are the good movies. Now, these are not the good movies. These have to be cut. These have scenes, etc., etc. Uh, what I recommend is check first reviews before watching. No? Um, we have to also temper yung what we all have, yung curiosity, and also being so up to date with movies. Because sometimes eh, we may be risking ourselves. Now, when we watch something that is not reviewed at all, now, so I, I also recommend wait first until somebody has seen it and has given perhaps a an evaluation. No? Now, I, I think better not really to risk it in relation to uh, a Netflix movie. No? You're watching a series that is not, you never know uh, what will happen or to be shown. So I, I, yeah, it is, I think, uh, the challenge for adults, no? self-control, the temperance for these things. One yeah. of the ladies uh, said common sense media is a yes. good resource. Common sense media also, yes. Um, general rule, uh, this is for all. This is what I tell adolescents because I deal with, I have been dealing with several before who have concerns in chastity. So uh, the setup of the computer inside one's room is very important. It has to be for the adolescent and for those who may have concerns with this, even adults. Um, the, it has to be viewable, possibly viewed, by people from the outside. What do I mean by this? For example, the door is always open. The door can be glass, uh, clear glass. If, uh, if it's an adolescent, that's good even. In my previous office, I always say this, in the, in the high school where I worked, um, it's always clear glass. And the computer can be seen by an outsider. And I always tell those students, look at how I set it up. It's not something that I boast, but it's be, it will be stupid of me if I go to sites. Why? Because people can see me. So there is a defense, a very powerful mechanism in our hearts called shame. Nakakahiya. <laughs> and I think we have to use it. It's so shameful to visit places that are not good, that we will be ashamed of, and to be easily checked on by others. So uh, if you, if a person can have the setup of his own screen in like, this room, et cetera, et cetera, then that would be a big help. Okay. Father, I didn't understand what were you saying about the setup. Uh, okay, uh, the screen that you are viewing could be the cell phone, it could be the laptop, will have to be easily viewed by others. For example, this is a no-no. And I, I tell them, I tell the parents um, in relation to rules at home, an adolescent cannot bring the cell phone to the bathroom. <laughs> Why? Because nobody can see him or her <laughs> what he's watching. Okay? Do you understand now? So you make it accessible for others' viewership. Your screen, your phone. No, not isolated. Definitely not in the most private uh, rooms no, of the house. That way, it's a self-defense uh, with the shame. Father, the next question is, who should we consult if we know of a person who is diagnosed with addiction to porn and has mm -hmm. committed adultery? But the, the, in those things, there are two, um, you would say, paths for that person. One is psychological plus you know, the, the spiritual side, which is to ask somebody who knows something about, about this to, to talk to him, you know, to encourage him to open up. You know? But that's also a difficult thing. You know? The person has to be convinced that he needs help. But the path really is to go psychological and to go spiritual. Sometimes they, they think it's only the one of the confession, the one of going to father, and that's it. No, it's not. Uh, it has to be both. It's good to go to confession, ask for forgiveness for that, and also really mention to the priest. Eh? Um, it's good to convince the that person, open it up. I really have a, a, an addiction to this. Eh? What can I do? And then small steps. Uh, there are ways how to combat this you know, addictions 
small things, uh, uh, things to fill up, for example, his day, changing the lifestyle, going clean. Uh, uh, a person can survive without internet. Huh? Uh, I think we all know. No? A person can survive without watching Netflix. Now, maybe it's, it's good if the person is convinced that that one is the trigger. Uh, Father, the next one is, how do you convince someone who doesn't practice chastity in their relationship to value it? Uh, well, uh, I think in the person's heart, she or he can easily detect the, the lack of happiness, no? the sadness. Especially if there was previous formation on this, meaning that the parents, she, can, she or he comes from a good family, um, very easily could be detected that loneliness no? because of a lifestyle that is not really what he dreamt of. No? Nobody wants to be unchaste since childhood. <laughs> no, a person wants really a family that is good, a wife, a husband, a supportive, um, single, um, one woman man, or a person dedicated to God, right? the life of celibacy, for example. No? So um, make that person sincere and detect the sadness in his or her heart. And then second, second is to give examples, testimonies of people in the same state who have lived chastity. He, ha he or she has to be surrounded with them. Because if he's only seeing friends or always going out to, I don't know what, pubs and, uh, and holy places, now Christians cannot go there, for example, then he thinks that that is okay. They're all hiding the sadness in their hearts. Uh, they're hiding from God. <laughs> so the pleasure that they could derive from this is temporary, is limited. And they become very sad. No. So th those are the things that we will have to make the person discover. You just have to be reawakened, I think. It's a sad life, no? yung lack of chastity. Whether you are in the celibate state or you are in the married state. How do we help friends who may have had traumatic experiences in their childhood in the lines of sexual abuse? They may either be the victims, they can go into same-sex relationship afterwards, for example, or the perpetrators, guilt even after having gone to confessions. Sometimes they have lost the joy of living. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, we have to pray a lot for them no? and pity them because this is something that really is so painful and can destroy lives. No? Previous experiences, victim victimized by another, the family or whatever. Um, depending on the experience, I would recommend really referring them to experts, no? um, psychologists again, no? uh, depending on the depth of such. So um, we could help them by really asking them to open this traumatic experience to an expert. Now, because there are ways how to undo it and the techniques of psychology are also very useful. Now, and we cannot uh, solve many things, especially the psyche. Uh, it's a science in itself. Uh, but um, yeah, um, for a friend who uh, who is always there, who knows the situation. And sometimes uh, it is also good just to target a small thing. For example, if we are in the state of addiction, maybe it's less frequency, first target. I hope you understand uh, what I mean. No? Meaning our goal long term is elimination of such a habit. Okay, but realistically, with the weakness of will, it is only to freak, uh, uh, make it less frequent or making him love a hobby or her love another, another thing or making sort of think of that less, make her, her or him be entertained. Maybe that could be the goal. Meaning small steps that could lead him or her to really see the beautiful life because of the trauma, um, the outlook the perspective can really be darkened. But when we show the light, when we show good things, when we show positive events, when we show our own, our own behavior, you know, happy, I think 
people change in small um, increments as well. Thank you, Father. Uh, Father, the next one is, how can we educate persons who laugh at lewd jokes? How can uh, we impart to them that the lewd jokes um, are offensive to women, offensive to all? What can uh, we do to address this? I think you're talking about men. <laughs> so, and the men, um, especially who laugh at those, um, find themselves sometimes uh, very in a, in a bind uh, in controlling themselves. Because laughter is natural. Eh, no? uh, it's something that you cannot just stop like that. No? So what was lacking perhaps is formation. So for those older or grown men who don't have formation, what can we do? We cannot do much. <laughs> so we will have to focus on inyong nariniko um, with seasoned or, or expert formators. No? With older people, perhaps we will hope for small increments but at the same time, at the same time, realizing that there could be a malformation that is so deep there. Now, a change of um, perspective for them may be very cumbersome. So for them, we'll just pray and then see what we can do. No? And, okay, but we focus on the younger, the younger ones. No? And that they, that they discover that laughing at these things is really lack of respect. Thank you, Father. Um, why do young people like to take pictures of themselves in bikini or no bikini and post this on the net? You have to ask them. No? But I think we are all, <laughs> all of us can be, uh, with a V, we can be vain. And I think that one is uh, one of the reasons why they do that. No? Why people want to appear in social media, why people post their photos, it could be. We cannot judge them though. No. No, but we have a human nature that is fallen. No. And uh, when there are behaviors like that, instead of being judgmental, no, uh, we will just try to cover it and excuse the person. Maybe uh, she finds it uh, whatever. No finds it entertaining where it's not, <laughs> finds it good. No? She was not uh, uh, told that it's not good. No? Lack of formation, in other words. And then if we can mention it through the right channels, we always say this in the Q&As, no? then we can correct. If you know the person, she is your sister pala. She's posting all the time. <laughs> okay. you, you embrace her, treat her, Go to an expensive restaurant and then say something. You know what? I see your post. It's not, I think, uh, the best of you. <laughs> okay, you're not saying that uh, she is uh, immodest. I, I think it's not the best of you. I think this, this dress is better. Ayan. So I think I have to buy you another. <laughs> and then you have to post that. Oh, the, you're, you're very positive uh, instead of... Uh, focusing on the previous posts and then you can say you no know, uh, people reacted you know and there was a reaction on that no maybe uh, um, a bit more skin but it's an opinion i know no? just think about it without uh, imposing your criteria you, know, you said something that she thinks about like i say those things are also in the formative point of view kulang nobody told her and sometimes in yeah, the interior workings of uh, the mind, no? it's, it could be vanity, it could be whatever. Uh, that's what I, I think. But if it's a stranger, nako, don't comment na. Eh. Don't uh, comment in the in the social media. Why are you wearing that? <laughs> you will end up debating <laughs> unnecessarily. On the area of modesty, it seems that the world is already desensitized when it comes to nakedness. You have worked uh, as a chaplain. Father, mm -hmm. for in a boys' school, do you know the sentiments of good boys when it comes to modesty of girls? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, normally they're attracted. Now, the thing is, um, uh, their their families matter. You know, um, the boys who live this virtue, who take care of it, also have fathers or mothers who are consistent with it in general. So they, it's repelling for them. Now, for example, when there's too much skin. Now, because 
it's awkward. It's 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 um it's foreign. It's alien to their culture. So as um maybe we forgot to highlight earlier, because chastity is not a a struggle of one's own period. It's it's a culture. Now, say if a boy has received a formation that he stops. Now those things are really uncomfortable. Now and so to girls who dress this or that, no, if they, they want, no, the good guys they cannot <laughs> cannot uh, miss those details. No? If they want the good guys, no? <laughs> if they want to attract the bad guys, I don't care anymore. There's so many out there, but there are good guys. There are also many, and they have to dress well. Other, um, how can one foster celibate vocations in the family? Is it related to consumerism and not just unchastity around which makes celibacy unattra uh, unattractive to some? Okay, well, one is uh, no, to, if, if we're talking about the family, uh, to pray a lot for family members, specifically the parents. No, um, celibacy is very attractive also if there is stability in the marriage of father and mother. Now, so it becomes so attractive because um, Puno eh, is, is uh, complete and uh, satisfied with love of the parents no? and he sees the love. No? Well, I'm not saying that uh, a person cannot become priest if the, uh, or cannot become celibate if the parents are, are not. It's just that they, we have to pray for strength, strong marriages and this um, stability in one's own sentiment in one's own lifestyle, in one's own self-gift also uh, becomes easier than the, than the alternative. If the parents don't love each other, it's so difficult to be attracted to celibacy because uh, mommy will have a problem. Uh, and later on, I have to take care of her if dad leaves her, uh, for example. I think you understand what I mean. Uh, so that's one. And then second, second um, contact with other families good families now who for example have many children and i've seen this um there are families who influence other families when they gather when they get together so um spot the families that are good and interact so lead persons to other families who have contact and have experience of such life it would be a consecrated life. It could be a life in the work, for example, in Opus Day, And then it's so natural, so natural, that they would share experiences to one another. Uh, Thank you, Father. John? How do you use the internet to lead people to the church and to God? Like playing games? Uh, this is a personal answer. Huh? There are many ways. I, I love talking using the internet. I think that's more a personal view. It's more effective than a post. I mean, people um, in the like button, they may click it, but they're not really into it because they click many other likes. But when you speak with another, when you are one on one or one on two or one or three, or you're talking with other persons, then you see how engaged they are and you can help. So I think the internet is a fantastic tool so I, I use the internet for this, for contacting people, asking them how they are, etc., etc. Okay, in the in your context, try to win friends through the games because you love playing games, but also talk to them. Later on, set up a uh, quote unquote after the game, perhaps. No, let's let's talk about anything lang. Okay, I, I think it's not unnatural. After the game, you talk about the game and then talk about other things. How about you in your family? What time do you eat? Uh, you, you try to make friends, in other words. Oh, okay. There's a limitation because personal is different, but you can already make waves, start already with friendships, even in the internet. There will come a time, we will have an opportunity for friendships that are personal. Talaga. We will just have to wait a bit. Thank you, Father. Yes. What are the, some Sorry. easy to do tips so it doesn't lead to the big sins against chastity? I remember growing up, uh, we, were always, we were always told as little girls, huh, don't uh, have sex, don't have sex. But uh, I never, why will I have sex? I'm playing volleyball. <laughs> uh, uh, Versus, now that I'm a, an adult, I realize maybe I could have been told like, um, 
don't confide very personal problems to the opposite sex. But it's easier. It's relatable. It's okay. Okay. Than, uh, than just giving the whole big, big crime. No, wala naman. It ah, okay. Never... You're talking about that of ano, um, you know, possibly committing premarital sex. Ah, uh, yeah. ang na sabi ko is yung first step palang yung pagka girlfriend sa adolescence. Ha? What I, I recommend is they have many. I think this is an advice not only of myself. No, collect and then select early age, and then when you're mature already, you can pick somebody you would be exclusive to. Because um, boyfriend girlfriend, no, in our present day, without guidance, can spell disaster. Promoting healthy relationships and delaying that, I think, could be could help many many people. And then say why. Why you have to protect the chastity? Explain it well to younger generation, because you want to give that to the person you will give your life to. That's a gift, virginity, for example. So don't don't uh, get close to it. Those are things I would say normally to younger persons. Probably the next one is um, eighty-year-old man married but separated from the wife for thirty. Mm -hmm. But living in with a 40-year-old lady who's like, mm. who's like a caregiver. Some 10 years ago, they tried to file for annulment, but um, not granted. So the, the lady advised them to cut the relationship, but both do not see the sin in it, nor can they live without the other. Mm. Uh, the, the wife is still alive. So how can, how can the lady is asking, how can I help them get out of the sinful union? Uh, so uh, the 10 years ago, it's a long time. Eh? So maybe it's good to approach again. Uh, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, have changed several attitudes in the church, including the process. Uh, so uh, it's worthwhile revisiting um, it via another priest. Okay, but in the meantime, being an outsider to this relationship and they don't see anything wrong, I think our role is to pray a lot, offer sacrifices. Now, because there's a repulsion or rejection of your advice. They're not open to the truth. Okay, in this case. So, what do we do? Pray. When there's no openness, no acceptance whatsoever or sign of it, ours will be praying and offering mortifications or sacrifices. Okay, you're, we're talking say, of priests, no? and uh, priests have their past life, all of us, no? and definitely uh, these things, no, with good formation, they have to be opened up. Okay, so um, do we forgive a priest? We have to assume that God forgave him already, because that was before his priesthood. Okay, so we also have to forgive him. However, because there is discomfort, because you're remembering, I think it's good to distance yourself and then try to close your eyes, close your ears about that priest. Because that's a long uh, past, a long time ago, a past sin. Okay? Now, regarding God's punishment, yes, God punishes people regardless of their status. I think it's good to say, that he loves the priests, and he gives them gifts, and he also expects a lot from us. So if we go astray, then there also is a consequent punishment for us. Okay, for those he has given more, he expects more. Okay, um, make them learn uh, their lesson. How do we relate the priests who were not celibate? So um, if there are priests who have sinned previous to their priesthood, if you have a confessor, just mention it and then leave it to him. Okay? If there are priests who have not act, been acting in their own dioceses, parishes, religious communities, you tell the, another priest whom you trust. Okay? Because there may be some steps to help that priest. But there, are, there are ways to help him, especially if it's public. 
If it's private, at least by mentioning to the priest whom to trust, whom is a concern, who's trying to struggle for holiness well. Because every priest then, eh, matters a lot, no? Now, Saint Josemaria would uh, die for the priest. There was a time he was thinking of leaving Opus Dei for, to, uh, to establish something for the priests. No? And he would give retreats to priests no? because he knows this, these people could be sad as well. No? Uh, so um, in relation to this, uh, if you know somebody who has, uh, quote-unquote, some struggling for holiness who can help, mention that. No? Mention your apprehensions so that the other one could be helped. Ang attitude ng priest, if I were, if you tell, told me, for example, and this priest is in my diocese, okay, and he is very close, he's working in my parish, I would ask around, investigate, and then perhaps talk to authorities because that he, he gives a bad name to the diocese or to the parish. No? Okay? But it's, it's, it's case to case, no? Uh, from your end, say it to the authority and then leave it in the hands of God. Step back and look at other holier priests. <laughs> but definitely, it's a plague. It's a plague, this reality that we have. We have married people who are not faithful. We have also priests who are not faithful. We will not be scandalized. We will pray for them and we will forgive them. Thank you, Father. That, that is... That's all I have, Father. We will now go and pray on the Hail Mary. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Amen. Mother Amen. of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour Amen. of our Amen. death. Amen. Amen. Holy Mary, handmaid of the Lord. Pray for pray us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.